Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another weekly edition of Condo Insider. So with me today, I have my guest, my special guest, uh, Mike Eisen with um, Insurance Associates. He works very closely with the president, Sue Savio. So he's our guest today. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, DNO insurance. Um, we cover it quite a bit, but we want to really go into a little bit more detail about um, breach of fiduciary duty and when negligence comes into play. Um, we, uh, we both think it's a really, really important topic that we need to remind board members, um, especially with some of our aging buildings that are doing a lot of repair contracts and have the duty to make sure that they're complying with their governing docs and, and, and making sure that the, the repairs are being done. They're not being ignored or they're not being like, oh, don't want to look at it, don't want to talk about it kind of a thing. So, um, so Mike, thank you for being with us today. Um, I really appreciate Thanks you being here. Thanks for having oh, me. Great. Um, so let's start off with um, when it becomes the breach of their fiduciary duty. You know, they have their governing docs, they have 514B. So um, where is that line drawn when they start to cross that line of breaching their fiduciary duty? Well, you know, that that's for um, that's for other people to decide. Well, first, what has to happen is someone makes a complaint to the to the association, to the board. Um, and they could say, hey, I'm upset. I, I think you did something wrong. Um, that's not really a DNO claim yet. What will happen when it's in writing, when you have a written demand for damages, at that point, it becomes crucial that you put the directors and officers liability policy on notice. And mm -hmm. then you'll either go to, you know, you could go to arbitration, mediation, litigation. You, you could determine if, if the board was responsible, were they negligent. So when someone files a claim, is it arbitration or is it mediation? Is there like a mandatory step before you um, take it over that? You know, it depends. I mean, you, you could have, you could have, a claim could come in through various ways. It could come in simply as an email saying, I want you to, okay. um, you know, allow me to paint my, my front door pink. Or, or you can, or it could come through a lawsuit. It could come through a civil lawsuit. It could come through a, a criminal complaint. It could come through like an EEOC complaint. So there's very, there's various ways that it could come through. Okay. Um, so, um, and when, it, when you talk about breach of their fiduciary duty, so let's talk about repairs in general, because that's really the yeah. biggest, one of the biggest items is, yeah. is the maintenance and repair. Yeah. Um, so, and the buildings are all aging, you know? I mean, the majority yeah. of them are all aging. They're doing a lot. A lot of things are breaking down, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Like recently, a lot of people are doing pipe repairs or pipe repairs. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, to me, is really scary to even think about it, you know? Because mm -hmm. um, how do you get in between the walls to replace your pipe? Yeah, yeah. You know, but, you know, some people can take, some boards can just kind of like take a blind eye to it. And, you know, some of these condos were built in the 70s. Um, or even mm -hmm. earlier than that, um, the pipes are all galvanized, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the leak is, it might not be visible because it's in mm -hmm. between the walls, but you know, they only last for so long mm -hmm. where they're gonna start making little pukas, rust pukas. And, um, and if the board just keeps ignoring it and ignoring it or saying, or, or mm -hmm. I, I can imagine that they're saying, oh no, the leak is in somebody else's unit, you know? Yeah and they're not really doing the proper investigative yeah. thing. So where does it come that, where insurance wise, it's like a breach of their fiduciary duty? Well, what you, what you gotta do, I mean, there, there's other think tech videos I was saying earlier, they, um, <laughs> that there's many and they, and they what, what the boards need to do is make sure that they're doing what they can, get educated, educate themselves, can talk to reserve specialists, talk to construction, um, people, because the insurance people, we, I, I could, I don't know how long pipes last, you know, we're not experts in pipes. You got to talk, the boards need to do what, they got to educate themselves and make sure they do the right things. And, and as long as they're doing that, then, then it's easier to defend against claims against um, breach of their fiduciary duty. So their but due diligence would be like, Okay, so we, ha we're, we, we know we have this constant flow of water. We're not sure where it's coming from. We've yeah. gone unit by unit, yeah. done some examinations, uh, you know, yep. to see if anything, anything obvious is leaking. Um, mm -hmm. They can't yeah. find the source. So now they're trying to hire or find someone that can even, because isn't there the machines that can, can kind of yeah. 
I kind of like, I want to say x-ray the walls and then you can kind of see where it's wet, right? Mm -hmm. um, so as long as they're doing things like that to try to figure it out. Yes, yes, and come to a plan, get, get, try to develop and try to do what a, a prudent person would do to try to solve the, solve the problems that they have. If they keep doing that, then um, they, they, it's a lot easier to defend a, a claim against for a breach of their fiduciary duty. If they're starting to do things where they're making decisions based on their own personal interests, um, then, then you might not have coverage when, when you try to have, um, you know, the, the DNO policy protect you as a board member. If, you, if you're doing things not in the best interest of the board, of, of the association, I'm sorry. Of the association as a whole, right? Yeah. So yeah. doing something like um, on based upon their own personal interests yeah. would be like they want a specific contractor to do the job. Well, yeah, maybe maybe uh, maybe you're you're on the board and you happen to be your, your spouse happens to own a construction company. And, oh yeah, that's the worst. <laughs> you know, and then then you know you could see how there could be a conflict of interest there. And you can, right. So you know, as a fiduciary of the association, you have to make sure you you know disclose all of that. And main thing, as long as you're operating with the best interests of your association, not yourself, but the association, then, then you really shouldn't have problems when you put in a DNO claim or when a claim is put in. Okay. So um, in a repair situation, so, and I'm like really scary because I know, I know a lot of board members are really taking their time to do their work on it, you know, yeah. especially with the pipe repairs. Um, cause I know there's several, um, condos going through that right now, plus yeah. the added on top of that with the fire sprinklers yeah. and doing all that kind of stuff, you know, um, I'm sure it's getting to the point where some of these boards are got a lot on their plate. Yes. Yes. You know? and, and that's understandable. Okay. I, I talked to some underwriters about that regarding what you can do. The main thing is if you have a plan and you show you know, you, you, you document that you're, you're trying to improve things. You're trying to get things better. Um, you're trying to fulfill your duties as described in your governing documents. That's, 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 that's you know, all that could be expected of you, I think. And what about like the board? You know, everybody thinks, thinks that they're, they operate in a silent, silent little um, office and they don't disseminate the information. So yeah. how would you suggest a board be able to communicate to their owners like hey these are the steps we're taking this is the issue so that all the owners know what's going on so you don't have someone coming up on a left field and say well you know you guys never tell us what you're doing yeah. so why are you doing this now you know you, you know i think it depends on the scope of the project that you're doing i mean when it gets really complex you, you probably might you know, it's a good idea to get a you know construction manager a con construction consultant involved to help organize that because it could get really complicated where you have to move people out of units and things could get very complicated. It really depends on the scope and the, the, you know, the expertise that you already have on the board. You, you might have people who are very familiar with construction on the board. So it, it really varies by association. So it's really keeping every homeowner, all the homeowners involved yeah. in like the planning stages. Hey, yeah. we're going to be replacing our windows. Uh, you know, they're 30 years old and they're starting to, the yeah. seals are starting to break off. You know, we're getting a lot of issues come, and, we're st and it's starting to affect, you know, the, the value home. of your home. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know, because um, the water's coming in. Right. Yeah. And so, it becomes more costly. And if you don't do anything, it's going to, it just leads to bigger problems. The drywall um, you, know, <laughs> you know, I, I think, I think it's, I would say work with your property manager, work with whoever, depending on the scope of the work, you know, work with construction um, managers. But whatever it is, you know, communication is key to, to um, preventing disagreement. Okay. Um, so let's go into this one other topic. Um, okay. About, um, so now everybody's under, you know, there's a lot of contracts out there now. Or yeah. pending contracts to go out there for like these pipe repairs, because that's a big issue. And anything yeah. regarding their fire sprinkler stuff um, or compliance with the RIF SAC. So um, a lot of contracts are being formed or being mm -hmm. talked about. So where does it come in? Because that was one thing that I read a lot about was um, some claims are against the AOs and the DNO for breach of contract mm -hmm. when it comes to their contract with a um, contractor. Um, yeah. So how does that affect a DNO in, um, insurance? Well, well DNO insurance, they typically will pay for the defense of, of a breach of contract claim. 
and it's usually a vendor that feels that they got fired um, inappropriately. Um, and that a lot of times what happens is um, you'll have a breach of contract claim when you have contentious board and one group of people overthrow another group of people and the new, the new, the new board fires a lot of vendors and they, they, they bring in their own people. And that's when you could get a breach. This is when you're likely to have a breach of contract claim. Um, but you got to keep in mind that when you do that, it's not going to cover, it's only going to cover the defense of, of that claim. Um, but wh whenever you do um, uh, repair work, big, big repair work, it's, it's very important that the board of directors who's making the decision, they, they first look into their governing documents because you could have, you could have requirements in your governing documents, for example, that require you to have bonding. For example, and, and, and you, you, so you, there might be requirements that you as a board member, you need to comply with, and you're not gonna know if, unless you read your governing documents. And you might, you might engage in a contract that was in conflict with your governing documents, and then you could have an upset unit owner saying you, you didn't follow the, the governing documents. So right, it, right. It, it all goes back to the board members have to educate themselves to, to know, what, know what they're responsible for. Can, can a contractor, or is it possible where, um, uh, the board has signed a contract with, with a contractor, mm -hmm. but it's been like, as we all know, permitting takes forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no timeline on how long they're going to take. So mm -hmm. now there's, um, it's like a year down the road and I've seen yeah. some where they've been a year down the road before, and they're still yeah. in permitting where, mm -hmm. um, now the, uh, maybe it's the opposite effect. You know, the contractor's like, Hey, I can't hold on to this contract for the same price. Mm -hmm. It's a year later. Mm -hmm. The price doesn't hold for a whole year. Yeah. You know, and, and what do you do then? If the association goes after the contractor saying, Hey, you know that permitting is a little bit yeah. messed up. You know, yeah. you took the contract and you, you know, and yeah. you, you, the guy even said, the contract even said to the board, it's like, be a while. Know, it takes a year <laughs> for permitting, you know? So, so what if the contractor goes back after the contract is signing, saying, Hey, we don't have our permits yet. It's been a year, so we're canceling this. Can the board you know, go after? Would they? And then, and then probably the contractor will sue the board, right? It's, it's probably important that before you sign the contract, you check with your attorney to make sure there are there are things you can do if you ever happen to have that situation. Um, because on the on the other side, if if the contractor starts to procure materials and things like that, they they could be out of money. You know, they could be out of money, and they they might have a legitimate issue. So I think yeah. it's, it's probably best that before you sign a contract, you talk to your attorney and make sure that those potential pitfalls are addressed. Yeah, you got to have this list of pitfalls. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so what is your best recommendation, um, especially for these guys that are undergoing a lot of pipe repair, spalling repair, especially, mm -hmm. you know, um, um, sometimes I'm afraid to go to Olive One and park underneath because I mean, <laughs> you have areas that are roped off because you see the chunks of concrete falling down. And I'm like, I'm not parking under there, <laughs> you know, but um, you have now all these um, issues coming up where, you know, the board's got to like pay attention, you know, yeah, absolutely. Be, a little bit, have to be, yeah. <laughs> be a little bit aggressive in their repairs, so to speak, within their budgets, mm -hmm. but not be afraid. Like, hey, the reality is a reality. If we got to raise raise maintenance fees, oh, got to yeah. do a special assessment. I mean, that's the reality of the world, right? Yeah, that's right. whether you if, if you live in a single family home that's not in an association, the cost of doing cost of maintenance goes up. I mean, you can't just keep maintenance fees the same. That's just the reality. Um, yeah, the reality in a single family home, you're constantly putting money away. Yeah, all yeah. the time because that roof repair is between twenty ten yeah. and twenty grand, right? You yeah, know, absolutely. so. Um, Hopefully that'll be done before your kids grow up and go to college. <laughs> then well, you're really I, don't, I, don't, I don't have kids. I have a dog and a cat. So, so I don't think they're going to college. <laughs> I was just talking to someone about that. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Got to get that done before they go off. <laughs> but, you know, the main thing is that the board members, they have to read their governing documents. You know, we, we had an issue I had earlier this week where there was an issue of who needed to maintain a particular area of the building. And really, there's no common sense that that will tell you the answer. The only way you know the answer is you look into the governing documents because you'll define what the dwelling is. It, it defines specifically what the dwelling is. So no board with their infinite wisdom could know it unless they read the governing documents. So you really got to start there. 
start there and and then try to do what's best on behalf of your association because that, that was a learning experience for me I, I i was surprised to see when i read the definition of dwelling in this particular condo association it, it, it was it went to very a, a lot of detail it went to a lot of detail to say what was part of the dwelling and what was not you know oh really yeah wow that's interesting uh, well yeah now that you bring it up because i had one um uh something that came up um the guy's toilet overflowed and um you think it was could be covered under his own policy yeah but it's actually covered under the condo master policy really not even yeah. like that too they have certain well, things that's covered by the by the association yeah that that's it, it, i mean that that's a topic for a whole another day but that, <laughs> that, that is pretty much the case that they, you, most governed documents will say that you have to ensure for the as-built um as-built condition of the unit so once that once there's a loss greater than the association's deductible the association policy is, is primary and, and is intended to pay for that. So where does Hawaii stand on DNO insurance? I know oh, uh, yeah. Sue had said many times that, that we're like the worst. So oh, there's we, we actually, so many carriers now. You know, th that, you know th that, that is true. You know, um, just before COVID um, last year, last January, they had a CI law convention in, in Las Vegas. And I, I, I met with a couple of the there's there's a handful of DNO companies and they all roll their eyes when they see us. They're like, oh my God, there the Hawaii guys come again. <laughs> um, we're really, you know, really bad. Anecdotally, they told me one carrier who writes a lot said that an average claim in Hawaii will be between fifty and seventy thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. But what 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 is important to understand is Hawaii is really small. You know, we, there's only a handful of companies that write directors and officers liability, but if we have maybe a thousand to two thousand associations throughout the whole state, mm -hmm. um, if California and Florida both have about fifty thousand each, so right. and we have so that yeah, fifty thousand spread across a longer. Yeah, I mean, a there's bigger. a lot. There's they have a lot more volume. They have a yeah. lot more volume than us. So we we put in a lot of claims. You know, we had a bunch of you know foreclosure related claims recently in recent years, and and it just takes a few of those to be very expensive, and all of a sudden. You know, as an insurance company, you could write 100% of the condos in Hawaii, and you'll lose business. You'll lose money. So, because we're such a small, small piece of the whole market, sure, yeah. it's, it's very easy for Hawaii to. You know, we, we don't have much leverage, I guess you can say. Um, so, um, so we have, so we have, and another issue too is we have high unit values. We, our, our unit values tend to be higher than than most. Um, most places in, in the country. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the higher the higher your unit values are, you tend the, the theory is that you tend to have a, a greater likelihood to be able to sue, be, more likely to have a complaint. So, yeah. When as because on the on the director's officer's liability applications, it's often asked what's the, what's the average value of the units there? Because as the value goes up, the likelihood of getting a complaint goes up. So. Oh, that's interesting to know. Yeah, so we have high values. We have low amount of volume in relation to everyone, and there's right. just slim picking. So Hawaii is it's kind of unfortunate. It's very it's very it's a very hard market. It's say, that Hawaii. ratio, it's that math ratio that throws yeah. us out of the ballpark. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, so, what is your best advice for a new board member that's coming onto the board? Oh. Um, in making sure that they protect themselves and the board and the project as a whole. Well, the, you you first have to start by, um, you know, re reading your governing documents. And if it doesn't make sense to you, ask. Try if there's a part that you don't understand, try to find some clarity by asking around. Um, educate yourself. However, you know, attend um, the different industry organization meetings. Uh, watch videos like this and watch. Watch all the other videos on fiduciary duties and things like that. Um, educate yourself. Um, that, that's the best you can do. And, and when, when you make decisions, make educated. Don't, don't just think your common sense is better than everyone else. Just do what you can to educate yourself. I mean, really, your decisions have to really come from your heart, that, that you've done your best due diligence on investigating. Yeah. Um, um, I know, like, one of the rules is, like, just because everybody says yes, don't don't just be um, yeah. a follower. I mean, you know, it's okay yeah. to, if you firmly believe it, 
um, that it should be no. I mean, you know, it's a no, yeah, right? Absolutely. You know? and, and as the main thing is you're, you're doing what you think is best for the association after doing your due diligence. Right, right. You do that, I think you'll, you won't have any problems or you shouldn't have. <laughs> you're less likely to have problems. You're going to have problems anyway. <laughs> you're going <get, laughs> to get sued anyway. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So we're nearing the end. Um, okay. And we covered mo the three topics I really wanted to cover for today. Mm -hmm. So but I really want to thank you for um, being on here today. Um, I know there's going to be a lot more talk about negligence and fiduciary duties, especially as it comes to repairs, because mm -hmm. that's the biggest hot ticket item lately. Um, but I also want to put in a little reminder to everybody. Um, and, and I just recently read it. So that's what kind of threw me off a little bit. I was reading the article about the Florida collapse mm -hmm. and they had talked about um, the HO6, right? Mm -hmm. So some people may get, may, will get compensation out of their HO6 policy. But one part of the article said that if um, in, the, in the Florida article, it said that people that have, their, have no mortgages might not have an HO6 policy because the insurance carrier does not have to have, I mean, the um, mortgage company does not require it because there is no mortgage company. So what is your advice to that? Even if you have zero mortgages? On oh, you, should have, you should have a homeowner's policy anyway. Um, the HO6. Yeah, yeah, you should have an HO6. I mean, some, some associations already require it under what, 514B, 143G, I think. Um, so whether you have a mortgage here or not, you might, your board, your association might require it. Um, but unless, unless you can afford, um, <laughs> To, to self insure a loss, I, I, it's a great idea to have a homeowner's, you okay. know, homeowner's insurance. So I just kind of want to put that tidbit into people that if you have yeah. a zero balance, even if it's a single family, a condo, you don't yeah. owe any debt on it, you still need the insurance to cover your stuff. I mean, single family home, yeah. I mean, you know, just because there's not a mortgage, you still need to rebuild. How are you going to yeah. do that if you don't have insurance, right? Yeah, the association so. policy is not going to cover your loss of use as well. So if you have to stay in a hotel or get other accommodations, right? Um, that's right. the only policy where you'll get the coverage. Yeah, yeah. So everybody's got to just an FYI that you, you need the HO6 policy with or without the debt of a mortgage. Okay. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I want to close with that. Do you have any closing remarks that you wanted to make? Anything? To no, this? not really. I think the main thing is when, when we, we talk about directors and officers liability, the main thing is that the boards just, you know, work in the best interest of your association. And to do that, educate yourself. I think that's the most important thing you can do. Okay, cool. Yep. And you can always come to our ACCA events. Um, a lot of people will email us questions and then we'll reply back as well to whatever the question is. Um, so we're very, um, I wanna say user-friendly um, because we really try to I mean, our whole purpose is to educate. So we really want to get that information out there. So again, Mike, I want to thank you <clears throat> for joining me today. Um, yeah. I know it was a little time out of your day, um, but thank you so much for being here and covering all these topics yeah. with us. Thanks for having me. Okay, thank you. Okay. Bye.